Hello and welcome to the Jakarta Futures Forum. I'm Pratna Shibasu, Associate Fellow with the Observer Research Foundation. And today we are talking about urban planning for the future. And I have with me uh, Shikshit Bhatta, founder of Riddhi, an open network initiative in Nepal, and Chavi Rajawat, former head of a village council uh, at a village close to Jaipur. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, urban populations uh, across the Indo-Pacific are set to surge uh, by hundreds of millions uh, in the coming decades, placing immense pressure on infrastructure, land, as well as resources. Uh, with congestion, heat stress, and housing shortages already straining cities, the stakes are quite high. And yet, despite uh, this rapid growth, uh, despite this, the rapid growth presents a rare chance to reimagine uh, urban futures, embedding climate resilience, integrating smart technologies, and empowering communities to shape their environments. In this conversation, we will explore how planners, investors, and communities can transform urbanization into a driver of greener, smarter, and more livable cities. Let me start with you first, uh, Shikshit. What is the best smart city innovation that you have seen? And how has it changed the lives of the people living there? Can this be adopted and replicated for other cities? Well, thank you. you know, I just came back from, uh, from Singapore. And uh, when you think of a smart city, I felt uh, as a tourist going there with my family, I felt it was uh, one of the examples of a good smart city not because we tend to see cities digitally enabled as smart ones, but there are a few things that I noted. One was that after a couple of days, you, you, you didn't even need a mobile phone to move around unless you're booking a cab. But if you, if you were to use the MRT, uh, the, the way the signages are placed and the way the MRTs are run, the way it's planned, it's impeccably well planned in a way that you don't need to rely on Google Maps to move from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think normally the misconception we have around smart cities is they are di digitally enabled and mobile enabled, right? And if you look at uh, the the way people move in our cities and especially the younger generation, uh, I could even see that in our own countries where. Uh, uh, where the kids are now plugged with their earphones and the way they move from one place to the other place. Uh, they, they rely mostly on Google Maps, right? but they don't know what the, their neighborhoods are called. But in our younger years, we used to interact with our neighborhoods. Right? Uh, but I think a smart city could be the one where uh, you're not always glued to a smartphone mm -hmm. because that creates people who are not aware of their surroundings. So I think in a way, a good city is the one where an individual is aware of the surroundings, aware of the communities, how they live, right? That's, that's one part of it. But the second part of it is how every part of community around the city can come together, right? A city does not only belong to a digitally enabled people or a smartphone holder. Uh, if you're looking at the urbanizations of our part of the world, it also belongs to street vendors. It also belongs to people who seek safety. And when we speak about smart technology, uh, just by having a good pavement or even a street light mm -hmm. uh, could enable the city to be smart because when you have a street light and when you have a good pavement, a woman can walk freely in that city uh, without fearing of any kind of a violence, right? Uh, so that's the other part of it. The third, of course, is uh, how it can include everyone and give economic opportunities to every other people who lives in that city. So basically, uh, for me, a good example of a smart city is one uh, that is technologically enabled, but uh, that also allows people to do without a smartphone. Mm -hmm or being constantly glued to a smartphone. That's how they can move around with, with safety. Uh, the second, of course, is how you can put these kind of infrastructures that make it safe uh, and equitable to every citizen who, who lives in this city. And the third, of course, um, is, is, is how our infrastructures can, uh, can manage that entire community and how you can make a city that's livable for all.
Wonderful. Thank you. It's a very interesting point about being rooted as well as technologically advanced. Coming to you now, Chavi, um, how, in your opinion, can cities make sure that smart city solutions don't leave behind the most vulnerable and marginalized communities? Hmm. Brilliant question. And I think appropriate given the kind of work that I have done. Um, if you look at cities um, and we think of urbanization or smart cities, I think we also need to shift our mindset from the perspective that it's only about mega cities because it is not. It's about uh, secondary cities, smaller towns, and even our own villages. Uh, so when we speak of um, creating those spaces, of course, it's only natural and a given that it has to be very, very inclusive, even if technology is being used, which more and more so is going to happen. Uh, we have to be very, very mindful of the fact that it has to be people driven and it has to be something that any and every individual can also use. Because I feel if an individual is made invisible, then we're not creating um, an equitable society or a city which is going to be inclusive. So I think that is something we have to be very, very mindful of. Uh, having said that, I think India has done considerably well. Of course, there is scope for more. Uh, but the fact that we have um, e-mitras or, or uh, digital kiosks, even in the most remotest of villages and remote areas, um, to ensure that e-governance and um, platforms um, which uh, allow for individuals, even if they're illiterate, to get the basic services, which could include uh, something as basic as paying your electricity bill, to generating data or getting access to your own information, which could be something as basic as land-related information, what we call the revenue records, Jama Bandi, which a farmer or any individual in the rural scape needs. So earlier it was difficult to have those accesses, but now with technology, it's become much easier for people within these remote areas and villages to get that access, even for beneficiaries uh, to get access to social welfare schemes so that they do not feel left out. Uh, likewise, for people who are moving out of villages looking for jobs, I think it is very important for smart cities to create those hubs which provide affordable housing, but not just that, also link those people who are migrating into bigger cities in the hope of a better education or better jobs, um, create links that grant them easy access to those jobs. And if unskilled, can we use the digital platforms to provide them the required skill set so they can earn more respectfully? Because I think at the end of the day, uh, when we're speaking of urbanization, we're speaking of uh, creating smart cities, we cannot overlook the fact that it's about providing dignity, providing respect to every single individual um, in our societies. So I think that's what I personally feel we need to cater to it. At the same time, given the impact uh, of climate change globally, we also have to ensure that we do not displace people for um, to cater to, uh, to the needs which could be regional or even global. Uh, when I say that, uh, what I'm trying to say is that we need to be, again, mindful and conscious of uh, not displacing our ecological resources, but actually building upon them, creating a better biodiversity. And towards that, we need to, uh, as Sachit said, it's important that we empower and educate our younger generations to be more respectful of that, because what's happening in the digital space is that people are becoming more self-centered and thinking that we can live in isolation when we actually cannot. Uh, we all coexist, not just as human beings, we're interdependent, but we're also interdependent as far as nature is concerned. I mean, to value and worship that. Thank you so much. Important values to keep in mind as we go forward. My last question is to both of you. Um, how can newer and emerging cities uh, tap blended finance to fund affordable, resilient, and digitally enabled infrastructure? We'll start with you first, Chavi. Sure. Um, so in India, again, there are some cities which have already done that. There has been blended finance they have tapped into, uh, where municipal bonds have been used and carbon credits, uh, so much so that uh, it allows for cities or states to reach out for international funding through that. Uh, the reason it is important, I'm glad you asked this question, is because of countries like ours, uh, where we do not have enough funding um, in terms of um, changing the scape, keeping the global climate change impact. 
uh, because we're still developing uh, the smaller states which require more funding uh, that is missing. So therefore, um, I feel this is a concept that people need to understand that you can raise your funds and you can create carbon credits. Um, uh, in fact, if I remember correctly, the gift city of Gujarat has been perhaps one of the first and, uh, and, and it's even listed in one of the international um, stock exchanges. Uh, likewise, newer cities, there is one in Maharashtra, I think it is called Palaf City, which is known and has been rated as one of the best in how it has been designed, um, keeping in mind the requirements um, of today and the future, uh, while also incorporating and making it community based and community driven. But I don't want to only just speak of cities. There are amazing villages. There is one in Meghalaya, uh, which is called Molinong. Uh, there's another one in Assam, which is called Majuli. Karnataka has Yana, and the two more, one in Himachal, one in Nagaland, where they have created community um, uh, enabled cleaner villages, mm -hmm. which are sustainable, which do sustainable housing, which are rated top for their ecological solutions, for cleanliness, for uh, creating the best rainwater harvesting structures. And why Meghalaya has repeatedly, the village in Meghalaya called Molnanong, I hope I'm saying it right. The reason it has repeatedly been ranked the highest and the best village uh, in India has been because of its community responsibility or rather the shared community responsibility where um, the community enforcement rules are not, not imposed upon people but are incorporated voluntarily. And I think that is, would be the beauty of what a smart city across anywhere should actually look like. Wonderful. Shikshit. Yeah, I think, you know, if you, if you look at this particular question about how we can enable more sustainable living and also about carbon uh, credits, for example, I personally feel that we've done a lot of disservice mm -hmm to the people who live in rural areas and the villages. Mm. Because if you go by a norm of energy being the universal currency, these people live their life with subsistence. Right? They account for very less energy uh, and the carbon uses. And their compromises that comes from their natural way of living mm. is funding the rich and the wealthy, including both people and the country. right? But unfortunately, if you look at the way, I'm not an expert in this, so there are caveats. I'm just talking as an entrepreneur and what kind of innovation we can have. It's the kind of carbon credit that the countries or the companies can get. It's not trickling down to these people, right? I think the world needs to pay some kind of reparations to these people. Now, can we think of designing a technology in which my own way of living, how much carbon I'm saving personally, and what kind of rebates I'm eligible for. Right? So that is one example. The second thing that I can think of is, look, we need to also go by our, our cultural rules. I mean, if you think about the countries that are urbanizing really, really fast, you're talking about countries in the Southeast Asia, India, Nepal, uh, Bangladesh, etc. But these country, countries have some common characteristics where we've been always living in rural areas, but we've been eating in the most sustainable way. Look at our plate, right? We don't uh, have a steak. We have everything combined. The way we live in joint families. There's a sense of community uh, because in the West, uh, the, the sense of community is not there because the unit of the society is an individual, right? So how can we bring the, the, the structure of living, both in terms of eating, living, and working as a community into the cities where we are not uh, driven by hypercapitalism, where you can, where you have to build a new house for every individual, and that's how it is valued, and that's how you create wealth. So, I think there are two things. One is we need to find a way and a technological solution by which an individual who is compromised or the way of living can get access to credit on real mm -hmm. time, and second is how we can learn from our culture of eating together, living together in the most sustainable way and how we can bring the same thing into cities. Uh, I think these two things blend into uh, mm -hmm. creating a more smarter city for the, for the large number of people that will be organized uh, in the next decade. 
Thank you very much. I think today's discussion has made one thing very clear. Uh, the future of Indo-Pacific cities will not just be defined by how they grow, but how mindfully we shape that growth. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you for listening.